Good morning. How are we doing this morning? Come on now. I was, we were in um, prayer last Saturday, two Saturdays ago, not this past Saturday. But it just rose up in my spirit that victory is a loud thing. How many of you have ever uh, been at a, a sports event and at the end of the game, at the end of the game, your team wins and it's a big, huge win. I mean, it's, and it came from behind victory. What do you do? Do you sit like we're sitting right now? Do, do we sit expressionless? Do we say, way to go. Way, way to go. We, we won. Yeah. Or is there a roar that comes out? There's a roar, isn't there? There's a roar. A roar of victory. Yes. Been all through this and at the very end we win. We win. We are victorious. Yes. Well, the victory has been won. Yes. There's a time to be quiet when we're learning and we're listening and we are trying to get it in. I mean, I don't want anyone, if I'm in a learning environment, I don't want somebody over in the corner yelling and screaming and hollering the whole time while I'm trying to learn. But after I've learned and got the victory, I want to roar. I can't, I, there's a, there is a, um, there is a, a, if you've ever been to the Billy Graham, uh, uh, the cove up at Billy Graham, they have pictures all along the walls. And there's this one picture, every time I go by it, it grabs me. And it's Dr. Billy Graham ministering in, I think, some part of Eastern Europe. And you look down upon the people, and all the faces are just sad and, and, and just... Not that his message wasn't, but they were coming from a, a very oppressed state. So they were gathering it. They were getting the information. They were, they were, they were, I, I, they looked like they were trying to hang on to every word. But you could tell that that countenance had been there for a long time. It was almost fixed on their faces. Just a, an oppressed, heavy look. It just looked like a very heavy, heavy look. And, and, and I thought to myself, that probably was not the same after a little while of allowing the Spirit of God in their lives. So I want us all to just stand up right quick and, and I want you to know that you're not an oppressed people. Uh, uh, those of us, and I think most of us here, we're of the kingdom of God. The, the king has come. The king has come. Jesus prayed, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom has come. He said, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Amen. The king has come. Amen. And he's ushered in a whole new kingdom. Yes. You know, why are you downcast, oh my soul? My soul trusts in God. Yes. So we don't, we're not downcast, though I know we have serious looks when we're, when we're listening. I know for me, when I'm listening, I'm trying to get something. My countenance is really, really serious. I'm trying to get it. But I want us to start out this morning knowing that we are no longer the oppressed. We are no longer the ones who have our heads down. We're no longer bowed down, bent over anymore. He has lifted up our countenance. He's the lifter up of our heads. He calls our heads to be lifted up. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest unto your soul. Uh, we were troubled. We had troubles. We, our souls were so troubled. But now, our king has come. I said, 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 our king has come. Come. Let somebody know it. Let him know it. Roar. Roar on the inside. Father, we thank you today. 
We bless you. We honor you today. We glorify you today. Thank you for giving us life. Thank you for giving us your abundance. Thank you for causing us to be winners and not losers. The head and not the tail. Above only and not beneath. Thank you for causing us to prosper in all areas of our lives. Thank you, Lord. You took us from a very difficult place. Now you've hit us in the cleft of the rock. You've expanded our territory. You've enlarged our space. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Some of y'all getting it. By the time we end today, you will have it. You will have it. Let's pray. If you would, uh, just hold hands with the person that you're comfortable with holding hands with. If you're not comfortable with holding their hand, don't hold the hand. All right, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We bless you. We honor you. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor this morning. We thank you that as your word goes forth, it will go forth unhindered and unchecked by any demonic force. That your word is powerful, it's mighty, to the breaking of strongholds. We thank you, Father, for the liberation that takes place every single time we hear your word. Every time we hear your word, we, we get to experience more of your liberty. And we bless you for it. I ask you to think through my mind and speak through my lips this morning. Words that will edify us, exhort us, comfort us, and provoke us to change. And we want to serve notice to the enemy this morning that he is defeated. Satan, you're defeated. You are under our feet. You cannot and you will not hinder anyone this day from having their spiritual needs met. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. All right. Okay. Get your, get your hand sanitizer out and go ahead and squirt it one, two times. You'll be all right. You know. All right. All right, well, we're going to get into the word today, Romans, uh, and we're really coming down to the final bit of the book of Romans. And so as we get into the latter part of uh, Romans 6, the latter part of 15 and 16, it's really kind of a, uh, a words that he's speaking to close out the book. So really we're in the heart of it t- this morning. We're in the heart of, um, of uh, or the ending, the conclusion of it all. And what we'll cover uh, this morning. So let's uh, get started. Romans uh, chapter 15. And um, hopefully you've uh, been kept, a look, kept up with us. We did a little bit of 15 on uh, Wednesday Bible study. And so we'll start there and, and uh, continue on. Romans chapter 15 verse 1 says, We who are strong have an obligation to bear the, with the failings of the weak. And not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Hmm. I'll, I'll stop. I'll get back to that. For whatever was written in former days was written for your instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, We might have hope. May the God of all endurance and encouragement grant you to live live in such harmony with one another in accord with Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus. That together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. For the glory of God. Now I went over this Wednesday, but I want to just touch on a few things so that uh, we can segue into this next part um, for today. The first thing I want us to see is this. It says, the first part, it says, um, we have an obligation. That word obligation simply means we owe it. Remember uh, back in uh, one of the chapters, earlier chapters of Romans, it says, owe no one anything except this. What is that? To love them. In other words, Pay off your car note, your house note, all your other notes. Pay your bills. But the one bill you can never pay off, the one debt you'll never pay off, is that of love. That means every day we go out, 
we owe someone love. So he says, we owe it to bear one another's weaknesses. We owe it every day. When we come in contact with people, we owe it to bear one another. Now, a, a good way always is to kind of um, treat it as, as something that, that you and I are in on a regular basis. So our relationships that we have on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, f you know for, for those who are married, think about it this way. We who are strong have an obligation. We owe it to our wife or our husband to bear with their failings. All right? We owe it to them. Now, just for a show of hands, no, you don't have to, <laughs> better not show your hand on this one. But how many of you know some things about your spouse that you've had to deal with since you've been married? Now, you don't have to answer it, but, but I know it's true. I, I know that because, not through my marriage, of course, but I know, <laughs> I know that because I know how long it takes people to change. It takes people, some things are ingrained in us from a childhood, depending on how we were raised. It was just, just we were raised that way, and, and it's so ingrained in us, some of those things might not come back until, come out until Jesus comes back. That's just the truth of the matter. They, they might not change until Jesus comes. But, but are we to just give up simply because that weakness is still there? I'm sure there's some areas of my life where my wife would like for me to be better. I know y'all eager to find out what areas, Pastor. <laughs> Please tell us so we can know. I done told you enough. 28 years of ministry, you know probably more about my life than I know about my life. No, but there, there are things where I'm certain, just, just idiosyncrasies, uh, scruples as it were, that I kind of grew up with or kind of came in my life that I have now while I'm in, married, uh, in marriage. And Lord knows she does. But I, I'm not giving up on her. I, I'm bearing with her weakness. I owe it to her to bear with her weakness. That's my commitment is to bear with her weaknesses, her failings. And likewise, she does the same for me. You know, there are certain things that are just, I just are not that, I'm just not that detailed. I mean, I'm, I, I asked her for something this morning, and I asked her, and I said, you, have you seen, which is a common question, have you, have you seen anyone else have those kind of questions? Have you, have you, have you seen my, have you seen any, any wise husband go through that on a regular basis? Anyone? <laughs> Mrs. Dawson, stop. Put your hands down. And then she has this unique ability, this unique ability to, to know exactly where it's at. And I'm like, how do you know? Something so small, something so insignificant. Oh, you left it right there. I saw it. I'm like, how do you know that? She's bearing with my weaknesses. I'm not that detailed. I'll put something down and forget where I put it. So she has a choice. Either bear with that weakness or leave me. And so for 20, uh, 30 years now, 30, for 30 years she's been bearing with that weakness. Now, it's not, a, it's not a anything immoral about that. It's just a scruple that I have. My brain doesn't work that way. If I put it down, sometimes I have to say, if I'm trying to keep, I, I have to say, I put it down right there. Otherwise, when I get up, it'll be there. That's what it means to bear. We're bearing. We owe it to one another. We're, we are in community, people. We belong to the body now. We are one big we now. We're not one big I, we're one big we. And because we're one big we, we have to look out for the other we's. Not just the one I. 
All right, so here we go. Let's keep on going because what we're seeing is the example of Jesus Christ here. He says, I have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Now, we understand based upon what we just, people come into church with scruples. The scruples primarily are not necessarily immorality. It's just religion. Well, this is the way we've always done it or this is how I grew up. This is, you know, and we have to bear with those weaknesses. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good and build him up. Everyone say build him up. So every day we're seeking an opportunity to build one another up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Now he's talking about the reproaches of those. In other words, all of us were a reproach to God. Our sin, our nature made us a reproach to God. And he's saying here, the reproaches of those who reproached you, all of them have fell on me. Now, what we've been teaching for the last, I don't know how many weeks, over a year in the book of Romans, is the key to all, all if, you're go, if we're going to advance in revelation of the things of God, we have to have a good revelation of our righteousness in Jesus Christ. And this one scripture kind of bears that out. He says, the reproaches of those who reproached me, God, all of those reproaches have fallen on Jesus. So any and everything that you are, think about it, any and everything that you've ever done, every reproach you have had against God, yeah, the ones that no one else knows about, that you've stuck in the closet of your soul and have never revealed to anyone, not anyone, not even your spouse have you told this. That reproach, fell on Jesus. The reproaches of a mass murderer has fallen on Jesus. That's why Ted Bundy was able to say, you know, he gave his life to Christ. A lot of people balked at it. A lot of religious people said, how can that be? God could never, not until you understand the revelation of Jesus Christ. How could anyone love him like that? How could anyone, how could he possibly get in after all that he has done and many others alike? And maybe people that have done things to you. Their reproaches have fallen upon Jesus. And he took them and absorbed them. And paid a price for them. But I want you to know when he came up on the third day, that spelled victory for everyone. See, the society that Jesus has created for us is a guilt-free society. It's an inferiority-free society. There are no little hymns and big U's or big U's and little hymns. Everyone is one because we all are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So in this society where there's the fruit of it is love, uh, is, uh, what is it, uh, righteousness, peace, and joy, that's, that's, that's in our existence now. That's who we are every single day. So in a sense we do, we are in this world, but we're not of this world. We're of the kingdom of God and we have to train our minds to think that way. We have to discipline ourselves to know that I'm no longer in this world as it pertains to my existence. My, my uh, true existence is now in the kingdom of God. So don't let anyone say shame on you. No, you take your shame and you put it somewhere. <laughs> I won't let no one shame me. I will not allow anyone to shame me because I am in Christ Jesus now. Amen. Does that mean that I do everything right? No. It doesn't mean that I may have even opportunities for people to point their fingers and to shame me. Yes. But I'm in Christ Jesus. All day, every day, every second, every minute, every hour, every day, 365 days a year, always I'm in the kingdom. It doesn't cease. 
Because you see, we, when we stepped into the kingdom of God, we stepped into uh, infinity, as it were. In other words, it keeps on going and going and going and going. It never ends. So that's who I am all the time. And his, what he did for me, the reproaches that he did, didn't only take care of my present tense reproaches, but also those in the past and anything that should come down the road. It goes, it goes present, it goes as far backwards as it needs to go, and it goes as far forward as it needs to go. So that's why when I came in here today, when we have, when you have victory, and see this is something you practice. Man, I got up this morning, and I rode my bike a little bit, and I put on some worship music, and I just worshiped and praised God real loud, real, real loud, real loud. Because I was just enjoying my victory. And I had singers through the music to help me enjoy my victory. They were playing just for me. So, are y'all getting this? Let's keep on going here. For Christ did not please himself. Verse 4. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. That through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, everyone see, hear that, through the scriptures we might have hope. Now, it's always good to have a, a, one another, a, but how many of you realize most of your time is spent alone? What do you do when you're alone? What do you do when you're alone and there's no one to build you up, to charge you up? Do you sit by and just wallow in self-defeat and depression and all that is wrong? Or do you get up and you begin to, to take the scriptures and begin to speak the word of God over you? Take a nice hot shower in the word of God. Let it cleanse your mind of any, any thoughts of defeat. Any thoughts of, of not being enough. Any thoughts of inferiority. And it's always the word. Listen to me, people. It's always, everything begins and ends with our perception and receiving and revelation of the word of God. Because there's not always going to be people around us to encourage us. Even as I mentioned on Wednesday, uh, when, Paul, when David was uh, fighting and his men went out to fight and they were in a place called Ziklag and they came back and their stuff, their goods were gone, their children were gone, their wives were gone, and the warriors that were with David wanted to take his life. They wanted to get him. And David pulled away. And you know what he did? The Bible says, and he encouraged himself in the Lord. He encouraged himself in the Lord. That's what we do in the mornings or in the evening, whatever you're, you're, whatever you're, if you're nocturnal, you are more of a, a night person, or if you wake up early and you like that space in the morning, then you do that, but you take the word of God and you encourage us. There's something phenomenal about the word. I don't know what it is, but when you speak it, you'll realize it does work. It will encourage you. So the scriptures are, are our hope and they create an endurance in us as we stay with the word of God. Verse 5 says, may the God of all endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus or with King Jesus. And so we are able to, don't ever say that you cannot be with them because you can if you are in the word and if you are in concert with Jesus Christ, then you can be with anyone, even the worst of them. You can, you can handle it. You can do it. Okay. And it says that together, listen, you may have one voice or one mind. Together, you may have one voice or one mind. Therefore, uh, the, together you may have one voice. Glor glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. And therein, here it is, therein lies the glory of God. So when we, in concert with the Spirit of God, as we are in concert with his word, 
then we're able to fit in the body. And we're able to fit in the body in such a way that we're not an adjutant in the body. Most of the time, using the, the, the illustration of marriage again, because it's, it's just real to many of us, is most of the time when I see the difficulties within the marriage, it's because one person or both parties won't entreat the word of God. Just, just won't, just, just won't, they won't do the word of God. They're projecting a need off, this is what I need from you, when really the one that should be meeting our needs is Jesus Christ. His word should be needing our needs. So that when we are coming within community, we're bringing him there with us. We're not necessarily needing anything from it, even though we're going to get our needs met through it. But it keeps us balanced. When we're not in the word of God, that's when we begin to get a little agitated and disturbed and upset and mean-spirited and, and find fault-finding and all that kind of stuff. But when we are in the word of God, we begin to be a welcoming party. We begin to work together. But when if one person within the body, as it were, or, or whatever, doesn't want to do that, then what happens is that they begin to be, uh, um, a, a, there's a place where just a stubborn resistance. And that stubborn resistance just makes it very difficult, as it were, to just kind of be in community with them. Because... The tension happens because one person is moving in one direction and the other person is moving in another direction. You see, tension is formed not, let me see if I can give you an example of it. Let me, can, can we find a, um, is there a rope or a string or something? I need something, uh, just something, no, a, a foot, two feet, whatever. Here you go, let me just use this right here. Let me, let me show you what this is. And Kim, if you don't mind, stand. yeah, there you go. There you go. Joel, please stand up for me again. So, so me and my son, we don't have tension. He may be behind me. Go, hold, it, hold that. He may be behind me, but as long as he's walking with me, you, <laughs> as long as he's walking with me, there's no tension. But now, let's say that I want to go in this direction and he doesn't. You feel the stress? The reason a lot of times we have stress in a marriage, in a relationship, in the body of Christ, is because not everybody, it doesn't matter how far he is behind me. It doesn't matter how far or whether he's mature or not as a believer or how long he's been a believer. It doesn't matter. There may be many behind, around him. As long as we're pulling... <laughs> As long as we're, we're going in the same direction, we're, we're good. Are y'all getting this? It's, it's when he doesn't want to go in the direction or when he stops that we have tension. What? Oh, he doesn't want to be in this. All right. How many of you are getting this? So, so when we're talking about, when he says bearing the, the, the weaknesses, as long as the weak are going in the direction, as long as we have scruples, but we're still, we're still trying to get it right. You got to be able to play in the sandbox together, no matter whether you can make a castle or all you can make is a puddle. You got to be able to be in the sand, the sand uh, box together. Are y'all understanding me? Sometimes people just don't want to play right in the sandbox. And then you just say, well, go get your own sandbox then. <laughs> but we, but when, we, when we are, when we are, listen, just using that analogy, I'm keeping it forward. When children are getting along well in the sandbox, it glorifies the father. It glorifies the parents. Look at my three kids. Look at them. They're just playing so wonderful. One is one years old. One is three years old. And then one is about Tim Smith's age, about 40-something. And they're just doing what? (laughs) 
No, they're all doing good. They're all here together and they're playing together and they're enjoying it together. And the Bible says that's what glorifies God. So when we think about the tensions that we have, even within the body of Christ, uh, even within in some of the things we've been dealing with here in our community of late, you know, God is not glorified when his body is not wanting to move together. When there's a devaluing of one another. We bear with one another's scruples. All right, let's get to this last part here. So in the latter part, verse 8, starting at verse 8, it says, For I tell you, now this is so powerful right here. He says, For I tell you that Christ became a servant. That Christ became a servant. Here's our example. He became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written. Now I want to stop right there and just deal with that. He became a servant. Christ became a servant. So when we take on Christ, when we fully, what is he fully cultivating us into? What is he pulling out? What, what is the, that salvation that we're working out of us? He's really working us into a place of being a servant. That we are, are serving one another. And the beauty about when everyone is a servant, serving one another, but all of them are kings and priests, then when everyone is serving one another, no one's need gets unmet. I'm being served by another king. I'm being served by another priest. And their whole goal, their whole ob objective is while I'm trying to serve them, they're trying to serve me. And I'm trying to serve them, they're trying to serve me. I'm trying to serve them, they're trying to serve me. You never go without when we seek the attitude of a servant. And he says, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus who, who made himself or emptied himself of his own um, uh, uh, majesty and, and, and who he was in, in God and came and became that of a servant. Now, listen to these, these scriptures that I want to share with you real quickly. Listen to Matthew chapter 12 and verse 15. It says, Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there and many followed him and he healed them all and ordered them not to make him known. Interesting. Interesting here. Let me read this one more time. Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there and many followed him and he healed them all and ordered them not to make him known. See, the heart of a servant is not to be seen, it's to be served. It's to serve, excuse me. The heart of a servant is not to be seen. The best waiter or waitresses that will be in your life are not those who are uh, taking up all the time at the table. It's those that, when did they bring the food out? Wow, that was, that was good. Well, who just poured, who just, who just filled up my water? It's not that person who is all up in your, your conversation and bringing a notice and trying to find significance. No, we, we just need you to fill, keep the water, bring the food out, and that's good. And people who do that well, they get good tips. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice. Listen, he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud. Nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory. And his name to the Gentiles, and in his name the Gentiles will hope. Now, this is our scripture, people. 
written in the Gospels, which is really Old Testament, because Jesus hadn't died and so there hadn't been a ratification of the New Testament yet. And it says here, for us. This is what he's saying to you and I. He says, until he brings justice to victory and his name to the Gentiles will be that of hope. Or his name, the Gentiles will hope. That's who we are. We're the Gentiles. Now, why is this important? I want to read this to you as well from um, another scripture. Uh, the same scripture, but I want to read it uh, through the, um, the, the Passion Translation. Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he left by another way. Massive crowds followed him from there, and he healed all who were sick. However, he sternly warned them not to tell others or disclose his real identity in order to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah. Take a careful look at my servant, my chosen one. I love him dearly and I find all my delight in him. I will breathe my spirit upon him and he will decree justice to the nations. He will not quarrel. Now, I heard someone say this one time. He said this, he said, a young man came to him, he's a leadership guru, um, what's his name, uh, John, John Maxwell. And he said somebody came to him in one of his meetings, he's teaching the 21 laws of leadership, and a guy came to him in his meeting and said, hey, could you please teach us, teach, I want you to come to our company and I want you to teach us business ethics. And he looked at him and said, there is no such thing. He says, there's no such thing as business ethics. He says, he says, what do you mean? He says, there's no such thing as business ethics. It's just ethics. They apply wherever. They're just ethics. That's why we get in trouble many times is that we have compartmentalized ethics. <laughs> and sometimes we have ethics over here but none over there. And so I want to say this in regards to justice. So it says here, um, be careful, look, and uh, I will breathe my, and I will not quarrel or raise his voice. Wait a minute, did I get to that? Yeah. Take careful, uh, where do we get to? The, uh, I will breathe my spirit upon him and, I, and he will decree justice to the nations. He will decree justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or raise his voice in public. He won't brush aside or bruise the broken. He will be gentle with the weak and feeble until his victory releases justice and the fame of his name will birth hope among the people. Now I said all of that about John Maxwell and this guy who came up and asked him because there is no such thing in my opinion as social justice. And so when we use it many times people use it as a buzzword to either get involved or to say that's them. Why don't we just talk about justice? <laughs> Why don't we just talk about what is just? Justice. Why don't we talk about what is right? Because the very moment we put social justice to it, the liberals claim it, the conservatives dismiss it. Depending on what side you're on. Oh, that, you, oh you're one of them. Oh, 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 I know where you're coming from. No, let's just talk justice here. Let's talk about what is right. Let's talk about what is right for your fellow men. Let's talk about what is right uh, within a uh, community at large. Let's talk about what is right here. Let's talk about justice. So a lot of people, you know, well, you, oh, you, you are part of the woke culture. Well, what that means? I don't even quite know what that means. I just know what justice looks like. Oh, you, 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 you talking about a, a CRT, right? You're one of those, C no, I, I'm talking about justice. 
Or to put it in the words of Allen Iverson, practice. We're talking about practice. Are you out? Okay. <laughs> they didn't get that. Lenny got it, didn't you? No, no, we're talking about justice. What is right when you steal, kill, destroy, rape, pillage? That doesn't have to be under the category of social justice. It's just justice. What is just? He says, I came to bring victory. I came to cause all the zeros of the world. I came to give them a claim to the kingdom now. I came, to, that's what the scriptures was talking about there when he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are just been down and out for so many years. He says, now yours is the kingdom. Let's stop making it about sides. Let's stop making it about which side you're on. Let's just talk about justice, people. Amen. Is it just? Is it just? Is it just to pay two people on the same job doing the same thing? Is it just to pay one more than the other because of the color of their skin? We're talking about justice. Ain't nothing to, have to, nothing to do with color of skin. It has to do with justice. Is it just to do that? Is it just? Is it just to take a child's life before they ever get to come into the world without a cho ability to decide whether or not they want to be here or not? Is it just to take their life? It not have nothing to do with right or left, conservative, liberal. It has to do with what is just. So many times we just get on a side and we stop thinking. And we get into group thought, group thinking. This is the way it is. Not realizing that we have a just God who's given us just instructions. Because he is just and he is the one who made the heavens and the earth. He is the one that knows everything there is to know about our existence. Why would we not listen to him? It's never been about behavior. It's been about his kingdom and his love for us. Therefore, he gives us instructions to save our lives. Once we get in the kingdom, for instance, let me give you an example of that real quick. Once we get in the kingdom of God, so I live in the kingdom of our neighborhood. And in our neighborhood, maybe some of you all are the same way, uh, everyone keeps their yard a certain way. Not the best, not the perfect, not deep, deep, you know, bluegrass green, but nice. You know, most people in our, in our community, I think most, most people keep their, their yards, you know, fairly kept. I mean, it's not the high end, it's not the low end, but it's fairly kept. Well, since I'm there, I might as well keep my yard up, right? <laughs> Understand, I got, in the, I got in the kingdom before, before the culture began to, to challenge me to, to live a better life. Are y'all listening? See, we made it about behavior. No, we're talking about the kingdom culture here. Listen, you got to get this. Is it warm in here? Oh, it's not warm. <laughs> Some of us are sure enough not warm. But, but we're, we're, we're talking, as, as we get ready to close this out, we're, we're trying to get an understanding of what is this kingdom really all about. Is it about rules? Is it about, no, it's not about any of that. It's the king has come, and the king has a certain, he says, all I want is you. If, if behavior, listen, if behavior got us into the kingdom, then behavior could get us kicked out of the kingdom. But behavior never got us in the kingdom. And that's what he boils it down to. Let me just get there, okay? So we don't waste the rest of this time. Listen to this latter part here. So as we close out, listen to what he says. He says, therefore, verse, um, 
verse, uh, the latter part of, of verse 9, thank you, it says in, in, in quotations, is quoting the Old Testament, he says, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. Now this is a, a, a scripture from the book of Isaiah. He says, therefore, and there's four categories here. First one is, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles, speaking of the Jews, and I will sing your praise. That's what he's talking about to the Jews. I will praise you amongst the Gentiles. And then he moves on. He says, and again it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. Now we in. First one, I'm going to praise you. And, and what they did, once they were praising them uh, outside of Gent with the Gentiles, what they did is they began to despise, in a sense, the Gentiles. They began like, well, we got it, and they don't. And then he shifts gear. Takes it up to second gear. He says, now I will rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. In other words, we're in there now. And again, he says, third gear, the praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let the peoples extol him. Now we don't shift it into third gear, have we? Now, now we're in there, right? And we think that we have a right to look back at the Jewish people and say, look at us now. We've got it. No, no, always remember from whence the tree and the fruit came from. Who did God come to first? So we don't forget them. It's because of them. Now listen, listen. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come. Even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles have hope. Three gear, four gears. Jewish people by themselves of God. Now, second gear. We in there. The Gentiles and the Jews. Third gear. Now the Gentiles, us, are beginning to extol him amongst the Jews. The Jewish people. His own people. And last one is it says here, he's going to rule over us completely and wholly one day. And that's why we have hope. Listen to the latter part of this. May the God of hope, listen, and you got to get this, this last part. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. This is the conclusion of the book of Romans. The conclusion is this. He came to the Jews he was their God. And they praised him amongst the Gentiles. Then he came to the Gentiles. And they praised together God. And then the Gentiles began to extol him amongst the Jews. The Jewish people, his own people. And then in the end he says, listen you guys, don't ever think that I've not always had you in my mind. I've always, always, always had you on my mind. So that there is no separation, no divide between either group anymore. They're all one in Christ Jesus. And he says that to end this all up, he says this is our hope. Jesus, it all boils down to Jesus. From zero to infinity. It's all about Jesus. He is our hope. It's not our education. It's not the color of our skin. It's not where we grew up at. It's not, it's none of those things. It's not our good behavior. It's none of those things. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. As we see all the things that are going on around us, we have a war over in the Ukraine now. We have a shooting last night in, uh, in Buffalo, New York. We have all these things that are going on. We have food shortages. We have all of these things that are seemingly cataclysmic right now. But our hope Amen. is in Jesus. We can go to bed at night. We can go to sleep at night. We don't have to be fearful when we go to bed at night. We can always believe no matter how high the gas goes. Every time I see the gas go high, I praise God a little louder. No matter where it goes, I will always have a means of getting around. And if I can't buy the gas, then he'll have to transport me. Like he was there, but now he's there. Are y'all with me? Our hope, our hope 
is in the Lord. Our hope, we need not fret. We need not be fearful. He's our just king. He is our righteousness. He is our victory. He is all of that to you and I. So don't get caught up in hopelessness when you have all the hope in the world through Jesus Christ. No need to be fearful. No need to be fretful. No matter what goes on around us. He is our hope. He is our hope. So why are you downcast, O oh my soul? You put your faith and your hope and your trust in God. He is a deliverer all through time. We've seen through Deborah, through Samson, through Jephthah, all his other names that, of him always coming through. Always, always coming through. Always coming through and delivering his people. Always. And that's his true nature. He will not let you down. He will not let us down. He's a faithful Lord. He's a just God. Please stand to your feet. Remember, when you get a revelation of Jesus, you get a revelation of hope. So we can abandon all of those presuppositions, so to speak, of this is what makes God love me. No, what makes God love you is his son, Jesus. You'll conform. If you stay with him long enough, you'll con your behavior will change. But don't ever think it's your behavior that keeps you from him or brings you to him. It is Jesus. Therefore, I don't, and you don't, we don't have to be beholden, as it were, to anything or anyone. We can love freely. We can love freely. And we can have hope. All the time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time together today. It's in you that we live and that we breathe and that we have our very being. We love you because you first loved us. We loved you because you sent your son not into this world to condemn us, but through him we might be saved. Father, the concept of revelation of, of righteousness in Christ Jesus. It's only difficult when we allow worthiness and worth and value and, and maybe things that we thought were, were what pleased you to get in the way. But we abandon those thoughts this morning, those, those thoughts that, that I just got to do enough or I've not done enough. But through the revelation of Jesus Christ, King Jesus, we understand that Jesus came and all he asked for was our surrender, our belief, our faith. So after all the other things fall, we will surrender to him. And upon that solid rock we stand today. The rock of Jesus Christ. Now our heads are still bowed and eyes are still closed. If you are here this morning or you're watching us online. And you say, Pastor Logan, I'm not saved. I'm not born again. I've never asked Jesus to come until I've never really surrendered to him. And that's really all it is. It's just a surrendering. It's not a, I'm going to do these things now. It's just a surrender. Just, I believe in him. And God has put it in each one of us. He's put it in all of us to believe, to believe in him. Sometimes we get that mixed up and believe in a whole lot of things. But we're all believers. But the question is, what is it you're believing in? You may be believing in yourself. Maybe believing in your job, your children. Maybe believing in your academics, your money. And all those things will fail. 
but our hope is in Jesus Christ and him alone. So if that's you this morning, we simply want to pray a prayer with you today to invite Jesus to come into your life. He's not a, as the scripture showed us today, he's not loud, he's not boisterous, he's not trying to make you surrender. Sometimes we've given him a bad name by our own works, but he's so very quiet in the sense of he will plead with you, he will work with you, he will, he will keep going along your side even when you want to push him out of the room, he'll just stay there. He's so gentle. So if you're here this morning and say, Pastor, I want this Jesus. I want him in my life. I want to surrender to him. Would you raise your hand that I may see it this morning? We simply want to pray with you today. Is there anyone here? Or anyone watching us online today? Well, let's pray this prayer. God in heaven, your word tells me that if I would simply confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead, I shall be saved. Jesus, come into my life today. I receive you as my Lord and as my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. If you prayed that prayer today, we want to welcome you to the family of God. Um, one scripture that I, I didn't get down to the bottom of it, but I wish I had while I was teaching. But he says, a bruised reed and a, and a candle that is just about to go out. He says he will not break it. He will not stuff out that candle. He's just super hypersensitive to all of us. Think about that just for a minute. Think about the people we may pass on the road sometime that are bruisery, just so fragile, will crack at any minute. And Jesus is like, let me protect it. And make sure it doesn't crack. Make sure it doesn't break. Or the candle, he's like, oh, watch, watch this candle. Let me make sure it doesn't, it doesn't go out. Oop, don't blow too hard. Let's keep this candle. That's what he's talking about. That's our Jesus. That's our Jesus. That's our Jesus. Hmm. going to receive our offering at this time. If you need an offering envelope, there should be one close by to you. Um, you may uh, um, go ahead and stand to your feet. I, you know, I, I just want us to get the revelation of Jesus. I just want us to get how wonderfully good he is so that we can just relax a little bit. And just relax. Not be troubled. Not wonder whether or not every day that constant thought of, am I good enough? You are. You're good enough. Not because of yourself, but because of him. That's the revelation. We're the we's now. It's no longer about you anymore. It's about him. It's about him. Everything is about his goodness, his mercy, his kindness. He initiated it all. All right. All right. Let's let's uh, um, 
Let's uh, make our confession of faith this morning. If you need an offering envelope, uh, you should have one near you. All right, let's, let's, is it up there? All right, let's go. Heavenly Father, we confess this day unto you that we've come to the inheritance which you swore to give us. We're in the land which you have provided for us in Jesus Christ. We were sinners serving Satan. He was our God. But we called upon the name of Jesus, and you heard our cry, and delivered us from the power of darkness, translated us into the kingdom of your dear Son. Jesus, as our Lord and High Priest, we bring the first fruits of our income, that you may worship the Lord our God with them. Father, we declare, because we have given, it is given unto us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will men give unto us. Because we have given tithes and offerings, you have opened up the windows of heaven unto us and have poured us out such a blessing that we do not have room enough to receive it. We also declare, because we have sown bountifully, we shall also reap bountifully. And you make in all grace, favor, and earthly blessings come to us in abundance so that we may always, in all circumstances, and whatever the need, be self-sufficient, requiring no aid or support, and furnished in every good deed and charitable donation. For you are the supplier of all of our needs and our desires. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, you know... Um, we can go ahead and receive the offering. Um, go ahead and, and, uh, and, and um, question, if you can, uh, uh, well, what are we going to do with the, today, okay. Um, where are we receiving the offering at? Back there. Okay, good. All right. Question, uh, as we get ready to leave, uh, go ahead and shut us down here in just a minute. Um, and you all can leave. But there's this, this song that, that I want you all to listen to as you're leaving. You don't have to stick around and, and dance to it. But um, uh, so anyway, before we leave today, uh, today is Miss Joyce Ruff's birthday. Her, you all right with me telling them? Well, you look good. You know, I mean, be proud of it. Her 66th birthday. God bless you. Amen. Good, 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 good. He's, yes, thank you. And any, uh, so happy birthday, Miss Joyce. Amen. Uh, anyone here for the very first time? I want to I recognize a few ladies here. Uh, but anyone outside of these, few la the, these three ladies that are here for the very first time? Anyone else? What these three ladies with uh, Gina Ellis, um, um, are, are we on or not? In, okay, we're fine. Unless y'all don't want to be seen, you know we got we got the camera on you. you know, your names are already messed up through the community now. You're, oh my goodness, terrible, terrible. No, we don't just want to say thank you all for coming. These ladies I've I've met through our book club over at Western Piedmont. We went through um, a book and then. Uh, we just talked for the last month. <laughs> but we had a great time. They were facilitators of just talking about, as we said, about justice. What does it look like? And we discussed it at length. Um, and so just give them a big wave um, right here. Just, to, yeah, right here. Thank you all. Thank you for coming today. And thank you for being a part of our service today. We're so very grateful uh, to have you uh, be with us today. And I've enjoyed um, uh, our time together in those, that, that, uh, the couple of series. Um, I, I tell y'all a quick joke um, uh, with it, that I said the first day. They didn't know what I was like. But anyway, they, we, we, they gave us the, the title of our books. And it was, it was called Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. Wasn't that, wasn't that the name of it? Uncomfortable kind. So I, I get the book. And the first thing I said is, um, um, do I need to read this? <laughs> <laughs> but they were great. They really were. And they went there. They were open and eager and willing to, to just listen and, and to also interject and speak. And, and I thoroughly, I'm so blessed today to have you all with us. Thank you for coming. All right, God, let's give everyone a big round, I guess, a big round of applause.
First time? I remember you very well. Okay, good. Good to see you all. Praise God. All right. Well, thank you. Um, Dina, there's a song back there as, uh, as we go off the air. Um, it's with uh, Donnie.